my absolute pleasure to welcome you to the next in our series of Beyond the Classroom events. And it's actually the very first one that we're hosting on behalf of the Faculty of Science and Health. Today's special guest, Moses Rashid. He actually studied here doing sports development a number of years ago. And I'm sure that there are a number of things that came throughout his studies that influenced his multi-million dollar business to a point now where he's able to credit a number of global ambassadors uh, within his very successful team. On stage, we have two pretty important people. First, my colleague and also one of my associate heads, Dr. Mike Rayner. Mike was on the same course as Moses, um, so I'm sure that there will be some stories that might emerge from this evening. And second, we have Paul Tilley, who is the university's director of sport and recreation. Paul was one of Moses' peers throughout university, and I'm sure the Purple Wednesday experiences will not be lost in this conversation as well. So it's my absolute honor to be able to pass over to both Mike and also to Paul, because they're gonna be sharing the couch with Moses this evening, and also sharing some of those interesting stories, but also hopefully a range of very useful tips that will help you as you move on to your future careers as well. So I'm going to pass over to Mike and Paul. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome to uh, the Ravelin Sports Centre here at the University, um, which I'm sure you'll agree is a fabulous um, facility. Not only is this a Beyond the Classroom event, but it's also linked to the official opening um, projects of this amazing new facility at the University. Now, 20 years ago, as Richard said, I was an undergraduate at the University at the same time as Moses, um, and I was as passionate about sport um, then as I am now, and it's something that Moses and I both share. Now, two decades after graduating from the University of Portsmouth, Moses is the founder and CEO of the Edit London, uh, which I'm sure you all know is the premium global online marketplace for limited sneakers, streetwear and collectibles. Now, the Edit London is a huge global hit, um, but it's not a first for Moses. It follows a very impressive career uh, in founding and establishing digital advertising and hospitality companies using his passion to turn them into successful enterprises. But even for someone of Moses' exceptional drive and vision, it is still quite some feat to go from a startup to a multi-million dollar global business in just over two years. And it turns out that he began it all in his bedroom during COVID. So it certainly is an inspiring example of turning your passion, passion into your fortune. And a reminder to all of us that through adversity, even that on the global scale as a pandemic that can be turned around into success with the right mindset and innovation. Today, the Edit London has three large retail concession spaces in the most exclusive shops in the world. Harrods in London, Galleries Lafayette in Doha, and Harvey Nichols in Riyadh. Plus, a two-year global partnership with the Chicago Bulls, where they have garnered celebrity investment from the likes of PJ Tucker, Lala Anthony, Jesse Lingard and Xavier McKinney, to name a few. And they are also regularly featured in global fashion's leading publications, such as Vogue, Forbes, GQ, Esquire, The Times and Hypebeast. Like Paul, like Paul and like Rich has already alluded to, I actually came to university 20 years ago, scary to say that, studying sports development. Um, with Moses. Now, I think it's fair to say that him and I had two very different career paths, and obviously part of this evening, we're going to hear a little bit more about uh, Moses' journey, and I think it's fair to say that Moses and the Edit London, not only a national sort of entity in the limited sneaker space, but they've certainly hit the global market, which we're going to discuss quite neatly today. So without further ado, please put your hands together and welcome Moses to the stage. A little bit like um, Graham Norton, Alan Carr, I think, is it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll be the Alan Carr then. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, right. Moses. Welcome, Moses. Welcome for coming this evening for the Beyond the Classroom. Um, before we get into some real detail about the Edit uh, London, um, I've got a bit of a story about 
Moses and how we came to meet. So as we said, you know, we were at university together. Do you remember that? Vaguely. Yeah, we, 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 we roughly cross paths in the classroom, right? <laughs> roughly. But genuinely, my very first memory of Moses is when we were first years, when we were freshers, right? Uh, we both got selected for first team football, first team rugby, believe it or not. Um, my first memory, nothing to do with sport, far from it. And those of you who have been here long enough or even know of the Langston campus will probably resonate with my thoughts. We didn't have such a luxury sports facility as what you do have now. It was pretty much like a cow shed that we had to get changed in. And my first memory was after the game. I have no idea what the score was at all. Or either game, the game actually. Uh, but Moses was walking around the change room which was shared between the men's rugby, men's football, holding a pair of GHDs <laughs> and looking for a plug socket. In this place, they didn't even have mirrors, Water, probably, <laughs> probably in, water. in all essence, right? Um, and he was there with these GHDs. So, you know, we've had quite a long journey since then, and a number of different sort of examples of that are initiations. Yeah. Do, you, do you remember your initiation at football? Again, vaguely. vaguely. I'm, so I'm off limits to say what I actually did at <laughs> university, but just for the reference of the video, I went to every single lecture all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> every single lecture. Actually, every weirdly, lecture. one of our modules that we studied was called Sport in the Media, and um, we had to do this sort of setting. Yeah. I wasn't. I was behind the scenes. I don't know what I was doing behind the scenes, but I was doing something behind the scenes. Uh, but we all end up the same grade. But Moses was one of the presenters, so you're quite familiar with this sort of environment, right? Do you remember that? Yeah, I remember. I mean, I, I actually can't believe that was a, that was a subject that we that we did. But it was a lot of fun, uh, a lot of fun. And um, to be honest, it was just us, you know, making. Actually, it was pretty cool content. I think that that came out with it. But yeah, it was good. Yeah. How, how did we view the finished product? I think that was the. You told me the story earlier today. Yeah, I think my view was probably in the bar, if I'm being perfectly honest with you. But um, yeah, weirdly, I don't know how this came about, but this is how the university changed in 20 years, if I'm honest with you, right? Yeah. Is that regardless of your role, we all got the same grade. Literally the same grade. Didn't matter if Moses was putting hours in upon hours or somebody just turning that for like 10 minutes. We all got the same grade. Um, so yeah, I don't really know the end product or where it went, but I have got a copy of it on my desk, actually. You're welcome to take it away with you. Um, but we cross paths in many, many different sort of situations, not only, you know, roughly academically. You know, we were probably the best examples in some of those environments, albeit for the camera, we were. Um, <laughs> but, you know, one of the big things that I remember, being a first-year rugby player, first-year football player, one of my initiations personally is that um, I had to do something quite chaotic in terms of causing a bit of chaos to the football team. And that was I had to steal their football kit. Yeah, so after, after the match, I did my initiation, I stole the football kit. And I took it to Walkabout, which is where Sainsbury's now is in the Guild Hall, and all the rugby team put it on. And it was their dress for the evening. And Paul's equivalent at the time was not too happy with that. I don't know if you remember, but I got a two-week ban from playing sport, and I think probably a month ban from the union the time um, but yeah it was all, all good fun I think we have many examples like that where we crossed paths yeah. but what, what was your what's your sort of sounding memory of our lives at, yeah I mean, to be honest we made such a great um, social circle of friends a lot of which that I still speak to today and, and I think um, if I was going to summarize very quickly again <laughs> because I'm off limits of what I can say um, is it was a lot of fun yeah, I think that's a good way to summarise it, if I'm honest with you. Then, um, I guess what everyone wants to hear then, you know, this is 20 years ago. So how, how does it feel, actually, coming back after 20 years? Do you know what? So I, I spend a lot of time between, like, London, the US, Saudi and so forth, and, and um, probably been back to Portsmouth maybe once in the last five years. Um, but it's quite a quite an incredible experience actually like firstly raveling park the gym swimming pool like i checked it out very early this morning um but it's come a long a hell of a long way since since our time yeah, yeah. good um so coming up onto the, the whole business of trainers and, and yeah. sneakers um i know that hype trainers are your passion yeah first of all can you just tell us what is a hype trainer um and what's fueled that for you Probably a little bit what I'm wearing right now, actually. I've kind of sat into it. Um, no, a, a hype sneaker, 
limited sneakers. I see a few of them. I think Rich, actually, you've uh, you brought out the big guns today as well. Um, you know, it's all it's all about you know getting your hands on that kind of um, on those kicks that you can't just walk into. I don't know JD Sports and buy. Um, what was the second part of the question? What fueled that sort of passion that you've got in those in, in this? Yeah, man. Um, I mean, I remember when I was. Oh, I don't know if I should say this, but when I was a kid, um, I used to wait for my sister. So I'd get my pocket money, wait for my sister to get hers. I used to go round the round the house and grab um, items around the house, wrap them up in newspaper, sell them to her. So then, when I had enough money, I'd go and buy a pair of Jordans. I mean, I did that when I was like five, six, seven years old, right? Um, and that kind of passion for um, just having like the coolest items has kind of fueled everything that they, the Edinburgh London's become. So I know I'll kind of walk you through um, the steps of, of kind of how I've done it and a bit about what, I, what I've done, but, you know, just to kind of give you the big headline, the, the Edinburgh London, which of course is now, um, you know, widely considered the most premium globally, was, was born out of pure, pure passion for just wanting to get cool stuff really quickly, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's funny, because I said to my wife, I said to her, I said, I'm going on the stage and I've got to, Got to be on the sofa with, with someone who's a fashion guru, with like, you know, what can I wear? So I've had to pull out the newest, cleanest trainers I had in my wardrobe, and it was not a very big choice um, I had. So, you know, what's your personal trainer collection like? Yeah, so you're talking about probably 300 pairs. 300. But basically, when I hit a cusp of 300, I have to, it's my own rule that I have to sell some. Now, the issue with that is, I probably buy sneakers at a rate of about four or five a week. So I'm constantly just selling them back on, so. Yeah. Do you have to buy them or do you just get them? Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm believe that. <laughs> it, be, being the owner of a, of a resale platform, I still pay resale. Like it's, you know, I'll, I'll enter the raffles in the way that, you know, everyone else does, but you know, it's, um, let's, call it, let's call it like a healthy, or unhealthy addiction. Yeah. So you kept it three. So where do you keep them? You got like a, a trainer. I've got sneaker room. Yeah, I've got sneaker rooms at home. Which actually, when when I first um, when I first launched the business, shall I, shall I get into how it started? I feel like am I skipping um, forward a little bit? Yeah, go on. Hold on. <laughs> <for that. laughs> when I um, when I launched the business again, I, you know, I've always been the guy that would just you know p pick up the, the pair of kicks or the, or that new hoodie or whatever. Uh, but I was at a, I was very much at a sneaker festival, buying some shoes for like six, seven hundred quid. And um, as I was giving the guy uh, the cash, I was just like, "Hey, buddy, do you have a plastic bag for me?" Um, and he said no, and it just blew my mind. I was paying a premium, but not getting a premium service. And so, as I walked away that day, I thought, "Well, all right. Well, if if you know what what exists in the market again, you guys will probably know StockX, you know Go and Laced and, and and those guys." But to me, there was nothing that was premium. So I thought, right, let's let's build it. And again, it was all fueled by that idea that I just wanted cool stuff before anyone else. And um, I'll go into some cool examples of what we've been doing <laughs> yeah, yeah. in the background. Yeah. So can you just talk us a little bit about um, about the story about how you took the Edit London from kind of your bedroom yeah. um, and exploding onto this world stage? And I presume it's you know that it was started from that experience of buying these trainers and not getting the kind of experience yeah. that you, you thought you'd get. Yeah, yeah, so, so I launched, so just to, just to kind of set the scene, so I've kind of built like three companies before I founded Edit London, which was in January of 2020. Two months later, of course, two or three months later, COVID happened and of course, you know, the world's going to, um, you know, falling apart. And um, so I'm set up this company and I'm kind of figuring out a little bit about e-commerce. I'm figuring out buying, I'm figuring out how we source, I'm figuring out marketing, you know, figure out payment solutions. And we got to about probably month six of having the business. Um, I mean, are you guys familiar with Klarna? You know, the pay in three solution? Yeah. So th they had approached me about being included in a um, Heartbeats for Sneakers Week, which was eight brands, Adidas, Foot Locker size, Shoe, the Soul. We were one of those eight brands and then got pumped across, you know, six, seven million of their customer base. So suddenly we saw this kind of traffic on the site pick up. Um, if you then fast forward to, I want to say it was August of, of, of 2020, uh, are you guys familiar with Defected Records? The big house record label. So I know one of the DJs and we kind of created this tour merch effectively. So. That then got sold on the Edit London site exclusively along with um, Defected's website. So starting to pick up a bit of heat and we had about 20% month-on-month growth there. 
but of course, I'm, you know, some of my mates have been furloughed. I'm paying the ground here and ground there to support what I'm doing. And to be clear, I didn't have a huge um, knowledge of, of actually what I was doing. I was just figuring it out on the job a little bit. When we hit, um, well, when we hit probably the end of that year, obviously that's when we did our first investment round, which is about a quarter of a million quid. And then we scaled it kind of 525% from year one to year two, another five, 600% the year after that. You know, on trajectory to do, to do another. Um, but there, there were some really key points in there, which were when we got to the very beginning of 2021, um, I was at a fashion show, uh, got chatting away with a chap called Gary James McQueen, which is Alexander McQueen's nephew. And then suddenly we designed with McQueen and we made these over, oversized uh, black tees with the Vanita skull, which was kind of the, the, the Alexander McQueen um, staple, if you like. Um, that actually then got us featured as a result on the Sky Arts, which was about a thousand, uh, sorry, about a million streams, slightly different. <laughs> and so, um, and that was in a virtual fashion show. Um, and then I think it was around, I want to say it was around Mar uh, March to May, um, Forbes approached me. Uh, and at this point, actually, I must say, it was called the Edit Man London. But, um, and actually what was really interesting, we, we had this huge rise of females that were buying on our site. And kind of as a, I guess we call it an acknowledgement of the rise of the female sneakerhead, uh, we dropped the man part of our name. So when we changed that, that's when we got picked up by Forbes and then, you know, it was the Times and then of course Harrods and, you know, and all the rest of it. So, yeah. So it's been a hell of a journey so far, isn't it? In a short space of time. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's, mo it's moving quickly, but it's a hell of a lot of fun. Yeah. Does it feel too quick at times? I mean, sometimes you're holding on and you're strapping yourselves in. <laughs> But that's the beauty of it, isn't it? And I think that, you know, the key, and hopefully if you can take anything away from today, it's all about just getting it done. You know, just, just put, put, putting your neck out there, uh, putting your money where your mouth is. Great to chat about it, you know, good, good for you. But if you just kind of get up and actually give it a go, you know, you, you'll be surprised actually what you can get out there and do, yeah. Um, you touched on the fact that you're in Harrods now, and we talked about that start, you're in a number of different places. Yeah. Um, tell us, how did you get into Harrods so early in being a business, being operated from your bedroom? Yeah, so I, um, <laughs> so I, I'd be, thankfully I'd been featured in the Times, and the, the headline said we're going to be the Amazon of sneakers, which I think was the photo actually you might have seen on some of these billboards I saw walking around here. And um, I got approached by Harrods and I thought it must be a joke. And uh, if you remember in COVID, um, there was a period of time when the countries that you could fly to were going kind of red and green and they were happening quite flippantly. So I just thought, right, I'm just gonna just pop over to Ibiza for like three days. There's a, gr there's a green window here, let's go. Um, but of course I had this meeting with Harrod. So obviously, um, you know, thinking it was a bit of a joke. Um, I took the video call thinking, yeah, it would just be one of my buddies messing around. Maybe one of you two. Um, <laughs> but, um, but no, I was wearing like this flowery shirt, palm tree swaying around in the background. And then obviously the call starts and you've got four people in suits on the thing. I was like, no, no, I've read the room completely wrong here. <laughs> so um, so that, was, that was it. And then it kind of went through, um, went, went through the process of trying to figure out. And I'll be honest, we, we almost said no to it because ultimately we're an e-com business. Um, and actually it was at that point we decided we were going to have an omnichannel approach. So when we said yes, we thought we'll test it for, for three months and kind of superseded target by about three, four hundred percent by way of what they gave us. Um, and then we signed another kind of three years. And, and if you kind of fast forward to now, um, still there across three floors um, in Gallery Lafayette in Doha, Harvey Nichols and Riyadh. We're opening up Dubai and Corp in Amsterdam. I've got new offers from New York, LA, Las Vegas and, and Dublin, a few more. So, and again, you know, it, it just just all came from that 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 one moment. Yeah. Yeah, and um, that's in, incredible. Optics. So that so in terms of um, in terms of that as a um, in terms of taking it out of that online in the bedroom. Yeah. And now moving into other places, such as that physical presence, was that something you ever thought the business would do? And is that do you see that overtaking the online? So, you know, I think. Um, we, we were talking earlier and I was asked the question, you know, did, did you think this was going to be global? You know, and the reality is you're going to get a lot of people that will go, yeah, I knew it from day one. I mean, that's complete nonsense. It, got, it kind of got to, 
about halfway through uh, 2020, and I thought, okay, we're, we're onto something here. Um, and actually, that was when I kind of took the, the onus to, to kind of raise the first investment round, as I said, was about a quarter of a million quid. If I fast forward to now, did, did I think it was going to be um, global in this way and obviously scale so quickly? You know, um, I, I think probably, I can tell you, I think it was the 17th of um, August 2020, I kind of made that decision in my head. I was like, this is what we're doing. And, um, and every kind of ounce of energy was kind of put into, you know, creating this, this global business. So a lot of people always ask, well, what's my, what's my job role? Like CEO of the Edit London, what, what does that mean? And I always say it's about how we put the Edit London into places we really shouldn't be. So again, whether that be Harrods or, of course, we'll talk about the Chicago Bulls stuff. Yeah. Um, or the New York Giants and these guys, it'll be, you know, that kind of thing. So if you, you think about it, what was your light bulb moment when you really genuinely thought you are on something? So you talk about Harrods, which is obviously prestigious, if we can talk about that generally, but like, what was the light bulb moment for you? Essentially what I needed to do, so there was a moment where, so I've kind of like touched on the fact that I own, um, you know, another company and, and, and so forth, and there was a moment where I kind of very much thought, right, I've, I've either got to, and I'd put a lot of money into this at this point, and I'm still trying to figure it out, um, actually, like, how to do all of this stuff, because, of course, it's not a one-man job, so I had a few people working for me at this point. And I threw out on my LinkedIn, I've got 20,000 people or whatever on there, um, looking to raise investment. Um, started having a bunch of conversations and, and what was quite overwhelming is that there was a lot of interest in what we were doing and actually people were seeing us and so at that point I kind of went away um, and at that point it was when I built a business plan <laughs> and at that, it was at that point I actually went and got the clarity that I required to, to you know ha have that um, you know understand where the kind of direction of travel was so what, whilst the light bulb moment in terms of the edit was, you know, that moment when I talk about getting the sneaker for six, seven hundred quid, it was actually, you know, what, eight, eight months later when actually it was like, OK, we're going all in on this. And, um, and then obviously we kind of scaled it from there. And that's, um, it's funny when you mention about that, because uh, people are saying when they start businesses, they think you have to have this big business plan and you have to have all this kind of investment before you get going. And actually, completely the opposite way around for you. And it's actually, it's just having that great idea and a passion. Um, and then the other things will come into place. We overthink it sometimes, don't we, I suppose? Yeah, um, I, think, I think that's the key. Like, if you do overthink it, you can spend so much time in that planning phase that actually it kind of hinders you from actually just getting out and getting it done. As for actually, I'd rather just kind of, you know, the whole thing of just saying yes and then just figuring it out is kind of the beauty of running, you know, any, any company. To be honest, so. yeah. And I read that. Well, we talked about it, and sort of, I've seen things that, you know, it's on track to hit kind of a, a pretty decent valuation. You know, you're talking hundreds of millions of pounds of valuation yeah. by 2026. You know, and that's phenomenal. You know, you know what do you attribute um, achieving such phenomenal growth in such a short period of time? Yeah. So there's probably a few elements to the to the answer. Um, Part one is just making sure we've got the right systems process and a kick-ass team that really deliver the vision and mission. I've got to say, like, a lot of my leadership team are just kind of, you know, in the trenches and really living and breathing the values of the company. Um, then you lump in this huge dollop of um, community and culture and just doing lots of really cool stuff. You know, kind of want to swear there. I don't know. Did it if I can? <laughs> no, no, I can't. So, um, <laughs> so, um, and just doing really, really cool stuff, right? So, you know, I was chatting to the, the, the basketball guys who, thankfully, um, you know, thanks for putting on the show earlier. Um, you know, we're doing a thing with NBA 2K. We're going to drop a two on two basketball tournament with the YouTubers, TikTokers. We're going to take what's happening on court, put it into the game by this gaming booth that's going to be next to the court, and we're going to bring a load of celebrities down. It's just doing that kind of really cool, or um, what do we do? Do you know, do you know um, Erling Haaland, the, the, the footballer? Right, so he's got like three golden boots. So he gave me a pair uh, for like a month. I think it's now in a museum in uh, Norway or something. He's like, mate, hold on to this. I was like, all right. And so um, popped it into Harrods in a trophy case. I thought, well, that's going to, you know, what, what do we do with this thing? So I decided we were going to fly a drone through Harrods, get this really cool content, and there was all these, like, cleaners jumping out the way at, like, 6 o'clock in the morning, um, shoot this real, re really cool content. But the idea really was about, 
you know, if you, if you turn up and take a selfie with the boots, you could then win two tickets to a Man City game and get a signed Erling shirt. So this was around um, when, when the team were obviously playing in, um, or the you know, England team were playing in Qatar. So just an example of like, you know, if you come along the journey, with, you know, if you come on the journey with us, we'll kind of give you, hopefully those money can't buy experiences. Like one thing we're actually about to drop, um, I think it's later this month, but have you guys seen the film Air, the Michael Jordan film? Yeah, it's pretty, pretty cool. So in the film, they show you two shoes, the 1984 Airship, which is the white one with the red, and then the Chicago, the, of course, the iconic 1985 Chicago. We actually have those two shoes at HQ, and we're going to drop them and create a sneaker exhibition, along with a hun another 150, whether they be game-worn shoes and so forth. And again, they'll be sent out to our customer base as like a free, hey, come and, come and check it out. And actually, you'll be able to buy them as well. So. Right, so you've been so so quite a clever use of marketing, innovation, disruption, social media, that's driving that growth really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And engagement, that's great. And you know, you touched on it. You mentioned about how how the Edit London's being sort of being being positioned as the Amazon of sneakers. Now, you know, that's a pretty big statement. Um, how do you feel about that? I wish I never came up with that statement, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but it got the headline. Um, no, I mean, you know, look, we, we, we have a same-day service that runs in London within the N25. We're launching that out in five different countries across the next 12 months. Um, you know, we've got storage facilities where resellers um, store product with us. And, we, you know, we'll also fulfill those to, other pro uh, to private clients or platforms, of course, for a fee. But yeah. that's part of the service, right? So, um, so actually, yeah, look, I think it's um, absolutely on point and by way of kind of direction of travel. Um, if you just think about what those components are, we're in the Amazon age of now. We want things right away, um, and then experience, right? So, so, so you, the UK's Jeff Bezos is that right? Oh. <laughs> Alan Carr's it. giving me stick. You've seen, seen it here first. <laughs> Unbelievable things. Yeah. Well, look, I, I can't let you escape because you've named it already. So, talk about the Chicago Bulls partnership. You, you, you mentioned that very early on. How did that come about? Tell us the story. And uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. You. So we do this thing in the office called inspiration sessions, where essentially we take a lot of the a lot of the younger team, and, and they kind of tell us older folk kind of like what should we be doing, and like what are the cool ideas that you can innovate from a marketing point of view. And uh, we're kind of going through this process, and they turned around to me. It was like, hey, hey, boss, um, what, what, if you could see the Edit London next to any brand, what would it be? And I was like, it's got to be the Chicago Bulls. You know, you've, if you think of sneakers, you think of Michael Jordan. You think of Jordan, you of course think of the Bulls, right? And they were like, do you think you can make it happen? I was like, of course I can. <laughs> Walked away and thought, bloody hell, how do I make this happen? So tra trawling my LinkedIn, and uh, I found one guy, one guy that was at the Bulls. He was like VP of marketing or something. I was like, hey, buddy, can we jump on a call and, and, and so forth? Now, about a week or two later, I walked into the office, and again, whilst this is all going on, um, on the inside of my arm, um, I've got significant dates in my life, which include, like, you know, my parents' anniversary, you know, my birthday when I exited the business. Um, and I wrote, and this was around July, August of uh, 2022, um, I, wrote, I wrote 2023, and I said, that's how much I believe it. And what do you mean? I said, they were like, what does 2023 mean? I said, it's the year that we break America. So. If you then fast forward about three weeks, four weeks afterwards, and at this point, I'm actually now speaking to the Bulls. We've had our first meeting. And then I start picking up calls with the New York Giants, the Miami Dolphins, the LA Rams, and, and, and so on. We then um, we got this designer in. She'd done a lot of work with Mikey and New Balance. And she drew this, uh, there's this iconic photo of Michael Jordan flying through the air, the whole crowd's looking at him and he's slam dunking. And it's just, it's just like one of the most iconic uh, things, which is where Air Jordan came from. So we've got our interpretation. We put this big mural inside the, uh, in the office, which is the first thing you see when you walk in, with the Edit London on the stanchion, which is the bit at the back of the basketball um, hoop. So that's like clear manifestation. So if we now fast forward to December, um, and I, it was about 3 p.m. Um, in the afternoon, I kind of felt a little bit like, I would imagine like a, a football agent would um, on transfer deadline day, right? <laughs> so I'm like two phones like this, and I've got the Miami Dolphins going, no, nah, no, nah, I'm not gonna pay that. Ne next one, the, the Giants, no, nah, no, nah, mate, I'm not gonna pay that. And they're kind of going through this whole process. 
And we get to, it must have been about one o'clock in the morning. And um, the balls have come to a number that I was comfortable with. And, um, and then they sent me the contract. And I thought, bloody hell, this is about to happen. I must have signed that in about 30 seconds. Didn't read one word on it. I was like, I'm taking, <laughs> taking the deal now. And I, and I sat there for probably a solid hour just kind of digesting like what the, the, the hell had happened. And um, in January of 2023, we actually announced the partnership through Esquire. Um, in Paris for Paris Fashion Week um, with their game against the Detroit Pistons. So quite, quite, quite a big moment. Yeah, yeah a huge moment. And, you know, you, you talk about 2023 being your year. And you know, in your article in Vogue, you mentioned that 2023 is a year you break the US, right? Yeah. And so far you've talked about different sporting brands. Is that, is that the strategy or is there a bigger US strategy that is a, as, the, as part of your strategy? Yeah, it's a great, great question. So we, we've kind of, so obviously, You've got a number of um, celebrity investors and we've got a whole bunch more coming in who are ranging from like big name rappers you'll probably know to NBA stars and stuff like that. Um, and obviously then it's about how we leverage that. The next bit is actually, if you look at the US market, you've got loads of like individual sneaker stores, but you've got very few like premium platforms. And so there's absolutely a market there. So the next bit is then how do you... Um, how do you kind of build that awareness? And I was saying to, to Paul earlier, and I'll share this with you now, um, I was with uh, Lala Anthony, and she invited me to uh, this kind of 50-person fundraiser. It's literally, what, like a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago? It was in New York, and she was, um, she was like, oh, come along to this thing. So I'm standing there speaking to um, Michael Rubin, who, of course, owns Fanatics, um, Russell Simmons, who has Def Jam Records, um, Carmelo Anthony, if you know your basketball, you know, part of the USA team, and then um, the mayor of New York. And, and they knew the brand, and I was like, bloody hell. Like, and that was a big kind of, uh, that was a big moment where I thought, right, okay, we've got something here. So, you know, we did, just to be clear, last year we did a raise of about 4.8 million, which I completed back in, in November. We've come back and we've, you know, we, we've opened up another raise specifically, specifically to attack the US. You know, global markets obviously are obviously certainly different to what you classically find here in the UK markets. Has yeah. that been a challenge for you? Have you found working across those different markets as something that you really thrive off or something that, you know, has been that sort of challenge? I, I absolutely love it, I've got to say. It's so, it's so interesting when you're going into a new market, you're trying to understand the nuances. Like, for example, what the US um, contingent wear is very different to what we wear out here. So they're really into like Jordan 11s, Jordan 12s, and things like that. Here, actually, we're very like Dunks, Jordan 1s, you know, um, you know Jordan mids, that kind of thing, right? Um, you then, we then look at uh, what we're doing out in Saudi or Qatar. Um, and actually, the trend is probably a few years behind here. So they're still picking up things like Yeezys and so forth. So I think from our, our point of view, adjusting our marketing and the way we're talking to people, um, and obviously for us, really to uh, aggressively hit the US. Like if you imagine, if you put, if, every, if any of you ever, uh, you know, either have a, uh, an online business or, or thinking about it, when you're putting um, pounds into paid marketing um, out in the US, it's a little bit like weeing in the wind, right? You've got so many people and the targeting just doesn't quite do it for you. So you need to get really uh, focused about where you put that cash. So. We've specifically started lumping cash into Chicago, of course, where we leverage the partnership, and then New York. But actually, New York's a big old place. So then we look at, say, Williamsburg. You've got Supreme, you've got Kith, you've got a load of people, you've got So House, right? So, so then we get hyper-local and start targeting those areas and start driving your return on ad spend and then come back. So it's that kind of approach to just get a little bit smarter about where we're putting our brand dollars and then, um, and then double down. Cool, and that's, that's something obviously you've learned over time in terms of your experience and engagement in that yeah. market. But now probably for the majority of people here, right, and it yeah. depresses me that I'm about to name so you're only 38 years of age. <laughs> but, you know, tell the audience what you did from leaving university at 21 years of age, you know, to building up different businesses to where you are now. What was your journey actually like in that process? So, so I did um, sports development, which I don't think is a course now, right? Paul Dilly, you, you've kicked it off. <laughs> no. Not me personally. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so 
to be honest, I, I, I wasn't 100% sure, you know, as many would, would say, wasn't 100% sure what I did, well, what I was going to do. And um, a lot of my uh, roommates or housemates had failed their third years. And so, you know, we were thinking, you know, I was like, how, how do I still hang out with them for another year, <laughs> right? And I uh, got approached by a guy and um, he, he, um, he offered me a job to be a club promoter, right? Which I'm sure there's probably a few in here. Um, very quickly realized there was a market, ended up getting money from a bank, ended up um, launching kind of two nights, took it up to five a week in two different countries, then approached some big brands like um, Samsung and, and, and a few others, managed to get these corporate hospitality agreements. And actually, not giving too much away, there, there was a moment where I basically said, I will pay for everything. It was a six figure sum, I'll pay for everything. And if you don't like it, um, don't pay me a penny. We turned a profit of £1,750 the day after, thank God. <laughs> thank God. <laughs> and, um, and sold the business a year later. So then I moved to London. I was age 23, <clears throat> very early 2007. Started working for uh, a recruitment firm within digital advertising, working with brands like FHM, uh, ESPN, Channel 4, ITV, etc. Um, I was saying before, the, the MD at the, point, uh, at the time just said, you know, what, um, what are you going to do here? You know, what, what's your five-year goal and all that jazz? I said, hey, buddy, in, uh, in five years, I'm going to run your company. I'm going to run my own. Just, you know, I hadn't even picked up a, a phone at this point. <laughs> and zero clue if I was any good at what I'd signed myself up for. Started my company two years later, um, which is September 09. So that was the very height of the first recession. And a lot of people were like, what are you doing? And I was like, there's money everywhere. You've just got to be smart enough to get it. That was my thing. And I was telling a story. I was, uh, again, I used to play football. I'd left that job on the Wednesday. Saturday, I played football, and I'd injured my ACL. On the Monday, I was like, I need to get going. So <clears throat> as I was, um, I got out at London Bridge, and I had these shorts on. My, knee, my legs swelled up, my crutches, and then it just started raining. And I thought, oh, my God, what have I done here? <laughs> And then, um, yeah, and then that, that company, I've still, you know, got, what, 13, 14 years later, global, et cetera. Um, launched another one at 28 in, you know, properties and did pretty well out of that. But, you know, if, if you'd ever asked me, you know, what would be the dream job, um, I would have probably told you one or two things. Which I would have been the fashion director for GQ, Hypebeast, one of these. Or if you know that film with Justin Timberlake, Friends of Benefits, the, the job that he does, super cool. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so the, obviously I didn't really feel like I had the skills or experience or, or, or know-how, so I thought, well, you know, this is me very much building it for myself, and I guess, like, the main thing there is, like, every single day, no matter how, you know, big and big, big we get, it, it's, you know, super exciting, and it's very much like a kid in a candy shop type scenario. Do you think there was a moment when you realised that you wanted to work for yourself, when you wanted to have your own business rather than working for someone? You described obviously working for a recruitment company. But was there a real moment where you always knew that you were going to, this is, this is my thing, I need to take ownership of what I want to do? I think, I think that was pretty earlier on. I think when I'd kind of started, you know, the, the, the first business and, you know, just figuring out what was happening and, and thankfully it was successful. But actually, you know, and I think that was kind of the thing. There was a very conscious decision. It was always about, like, how do I grow? How do I grow? If you ask my dad, um, I, remember there were, there were <laughs> I remember there were moments. I used to go around the house. I used to, take, used to have these little toy cars, which were, like, really... Um, they were collectibles, apparently. But she consistently tells me, I used to go down the car boot sale and sell them for, like, 15, 20p, thinking I was making a load of cash. So, <laughs> so I think it probably came from an early age, but it's just kind of, you know, accelerated as I've got a bit older. Fair enough. If you were my kid, my hands would be going straight yeah. down your neck right in that moment. I, I, actually, I, I, I actually sold his VW camper van as well. <laughs> Not terrible. <laughs> more, more than 20p, though, for that. Yeah, one. 500 quid. Yeah. I've never <laughs> seen... He's still so angry to this day. For... <laughs> Rightly so, I'll be honest with you. It's a true um, story, yeah. So, so you know, many, many people in this audience right, are very, uh, very much sort of in the mindset of thinking about business startups, entrepreneurship, yeah. innovation, right? Um, based on your years of experience across different markets, actually, but more specifically what you currently do now, what would be your top tips you would suggest to this particular group of students? Do, do we have anyone in here like, looking to set up a business or a side hustle or anything like that? We've got a few. 
What go on the Jordan tea? What 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 is it? Um, so well, we created a uh, protein bomb product. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, so it's like a blocker, but it's carry protein so you can take whatever you want. Amazing. And it, do we have anyone else here that's doing similar things? Guy in the back. Really? You sneak, you sneak a reseller. Amazing. So, what I find really interesting is, all right. So the top tips are like go out and do it like these guys. You know. Um, we're all on the same kind of playing field, right? When we start, we're made of the same stuff. There's no difference between me and you. Um, I think, you know, just having a little bit of gumption to, to just put, put a little bit on the line and, hey, look, what's the worst that can happen? You get a load of really amazing experience. And then you can, you know, walk into, your, you know, your next job and, and say, hey, look, I've done this and, and, um, and here we go. And I think, like, when we talk about, like, experience, it's so invaluable as you're, you know, as you're progressing. So, um, yeah, does that, does that cover the question? Yeah, it does, yeah. I think, you know, one of the things that I teach, right, when I teach entrepreneurship, right, she's here, who, who's part of that program, is don't be afraid to fail. It's kind of one of the big messages that come out and just to really back your idea. And I think, you know, your trajectory, and all the different things you've done. I don't know, it's, it's, it's really inspiring just to hear your story about your journey and about how the Edit London's kind of developed um, and your broader business successes. You know, what's next for you and, uh, and, and for, your, for your businesses? Yeah, I think, um, you know, um, I said we we're going to own the US 20, end of 2023, you know, and um, 2026 we'll be doing our partial exit to private equity. You know, we'll take it to a billion dollar company within three years. That's very much the hyper focus and I could lay down week on week, month by month, exactly how we're going to do it um, and have complete confidence in that. You know, vision and mission. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. Well, look, you know, we're, we're, we're very much looking forward to seeing how that journey goes over the next couple of years, following you and, uh, and, and celebrating that with you as well, because I think it's a, a big thing for us as a university to actually celebrate those successes um, of, our, of our former students um, who are going on to achieve um, some fantastic things. Look, I know our audience is going to be um, burning to ask you um, some questions. So if it's OK, yeah. I'm going to hand over to them. So we've got a microphone that's roving around. If you put your hands up in the air, so we've got the first one just up there uh, for Temi. Hi, um, just a quick one. It's about, there obviously there have, been, there have been moments in time where you, there's like a brick wall there um, and you feel like it's the end of your batch day. How do you keep on going and what was the driving force for just keeping, keeping on going basically for you basically? Yeah, I think, again, it comes down to just accepting that, actually, um, I, I always say, like, with a, lot of, with a lot of businesses, there's very rarely middle ground, right? You have these peaks and troughs. And um, I think part one is just accepting that's going to happen. And part, part two is then having, when you've got clarity on that vision and mission and kind of what that three, four, five-year goal is, that actually informs your shorter-term decisions. So once you know that, Actually, you can succession plan for those speed bumps along the way. Um, and again, look, the reality is we're going to have to move left and right before we move forward sometimes. Sometimes we're going to have to take a step back before we go too forward. And that, it just is what it is, right? Um, but, but again, if we get focused on the direction of travel, then, you know, that problem-solving, pragmatic piece will, will always kick in. Yeah. Uh, throughout your journey, uh, is there someone that's been a, a vital part towards your journey? Is there someone that you can say uh, that they've really, really um, impacted your journey and what have they done to do so? Yeah, I think it's, um, it's really important. It's really important to, you know, e even throughout my years, actually, I've always used a business coach, which keeps me accountable, right? Um, and I think it's really important, you know, whether it be a mentor um, and somebody, you know, these guys, for example, um, that actually you can talk about your successes, but actually turn around and say, hey, look, I just need a little bit of um, creative thinking around this. Let's try and figure this out together. So whether that be your peers, um, you know, or in my case, a business coach, you know, which, I, which actually I've used for probably, I want to say maybe as long as 10 years, actually. So, um, for, you know, for that reason. Thank you. No worries. Hey, so, question. Love this Naturally. Guy. I love this guy. My guess. <laughs> <laughs> Just in the first few words, you know, it's all charisma. So, what I wanted to ask you was, as you said, when you were first starting, and generally speaking, it's just going out and just doing it, right? Yeah. That's the most important bit. But 
getting your first 100 sales, how did you do it? What was the, like, let's say three things, important things that you did that helped you get your first 100 sales? And if you don't mind, what, how you led that to your next 1,000 sales? Another great question. That's a big, that's a big answer. <laughs> He should be doing your job, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> come here, come here. I want to get this guy on stage. Um, so, do you know what was really funny? Um, I mean, I shouldn't laugh because it was um, not so funny at the time, but I remember it was quite early on into the journey and we started putting some money into paid marketing, right? And obviously you think, oh, if I put a load of money on Google, you're going to start making a load of sales. And we, <laughs> we went through this period where we were getting loads and loads of sales in this one month. And actually what I realised is that I was being frauded by a bunch of guys in Eastern Europe. <laughs> not sending out these Yeezys into wherever they were going. Um, and obviously then you kind of figure out fraud rules and payment protections and all that. Um, but to, to, to answer your question, how, how do you take it from 100 sales to 1,000 sales to a million sales? You kind of break it down, right? So you need the, the value proposition for us is all about speed you know, service and product cur curation. So we really lump into those three buckets and we get focused on what the USP is. Second part is then how do you do, from a marketing awareness point of view, how do you kind of cut through the noise and make sure that people see your brand? Now, the reality is if you get served uh, an advert on your mobile or, or, or online, um, you're probably just going to gloss over it, right? Um, and then you need that element of seeing it two, three, four times before you actually become curious and bother going on the site. So really it's about just breaking down each of those elements that are the most important. In my case, we outsourced the bits that we weren't experts in. So actually paid social, paid media at the beginning, I was like, I don't have any clue. I'm going to go find experts that do and kind of bring in the agencies. And then actually from there, um, to answer your question, like how did we scale so quickly? If I'm, if I'm honest, I'm not great with numbers. I'm not great with spreadsheets, but I'm very aware of that. Um, what I'm good at is, is, as I say, kind of doing that vision, mission, putting ourselves. So I brought in the people that could do that. And actually, if I look at our COO, um, Millie Pearson, she's amazing by way of the detail. And that's just not me. So I, I, make, I tend to actually make decisions based off probably three or four bullet points all the time. So, <laughs> so it kind of gives you an idea. The short, the short version, to summarize, is, is, is um, make sure you're doing that thing, which is like, how are people going to hear of us? And also, you know, in my case, it's all about authenticity and, and, and trust. Um, how do you bring in the people that can support the journey uh, and, and get you focused on the stuff you're going to do, right? Actually, for any, uh, I'll, I'll kind of give you this analogy to kind of walk away with, right? So if any of you guys have got small businesses, I know there's a couple um, or quite a few here. In any small business, we basically do exactly the same thing, right? So you've got the technician doing the doing. You've got, the, you've got the operations doing kind of the, ma the management, and then you've got the entrepreneur doing the vision and mission. Now, of course, in any small business, you're doing all three things at the same time. So, of course, you can't do them 100%. Or you pivot from one to the other. It's just a very natural thing we do, right? So, again, in my experience, it's like, right, how do I just do the stuff I'm great at, which is that top of funnel stuff, and I'll just bring in the other guys to, to do it? Oh. I had a question to ask as a businessman. Of course. Um, what was your biggest challenge and how did you solve it? And what was the decision you made in your career that you wish you didn't make it something you know, to make us be aware of so we don't make that mistake? What was the biggest challenge? I, 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 honestly, there were quite a few. I mean, actually, if you look at any of the, I mean, even if I just focus on the Edit London, right, I gave you the, the idea that we're pumping money in and being frauded. Um, but, you know, there, there are so many challenges, whether it be, I was asked the question earlier, like, what, what's our biggest um, barrier to growth? What's, what's the thing that worries me the most? Actually, we're growing so quickly that, of course, you need the capital to continue to, to grow the business. So, um, yeah, a few, a few challenges, but actually, like, right at the beginning, um, like it was COVID. We we're trying to figure out Brexit. We we're trying to figure out all these components of getting a product from A to B, um, you know, and A to B to C. So there's all these things, but the beautiful thing about human beings is that we just figure stuff out. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. It seems like you've done quite, you started one business in recession, next business in COVID. Seem to thrive off these uh, these dips, <laughs> these, yeah. uh, these, these things, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> right. 
next time, next time something goes wrong, everyone focus on what Moses does. <laughs> do, you, do, you know what, do you know what's interesting? So some, somebody said something like that, and I was like, uh, so we, we, I upped the marketing budgets by about 100% on, on everything. And they were like, why are you doing that? So well, whilst every single person is pulling back, yeah. so where we create market share, we're going we're gonna to double down and get more bullish about how we enter the, into these markets, mm. because that's, that, that's how you do it. So Yeah, great. Okay. How, what systems are in place when you're hiring staff? And then how do you go about retaining staff? And if you could, would you replace any with AI? How, how do you go about hiring and retaining staff? Um, you know, look, it, it, we're in a very fortunate place that we've got a really cool brand that people want to be a part of. So actually, we get a lot of approaches, particularly when we, you know, we put a roll up and there'll be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of applications. When we're going through that, really, you know, d depending on the role and, of course, the level, I guess there's part one where you're looking for experience, but actually at the kind of exec and assistant levels, it's all about attitude, you know, people, um, do they have the right mindset? You know, we've got, in our ops team, we've got a former chef. He's the coolest cucumber under pressure, right? Mm -hmm. But he's just like, he's just used to doing it. And he's, he's one of our star performers. He'll go on to run business units within the business. But then we've got somebody from... You know, director of fashion from Netta Porter. She brings a wealth of experience that you know we don't have at the moment. So um, the second part of your question: How do you retain staff? Well, part one is making sure that we're all aligned by way of the values of the business. Right. Um, you know, one of our values is um, create, lead, inspire, and drop the mic. So actually, we consciously shout out people's successes or be like Mike. Right. You know, that's another one that splashed across our wall underneath that 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 mural I talked to you about. Um, then, of course, it's about providing the right amount of challenge, stretch, support, and motivation to make sure that actually that element of how people are motivated, you know, you've got a few layers of motivation, mm. right? Um, you know, you've got uh, mastery. How do you become best in class? You've got autonomy. You've got cash. But actually, once they're all satisfied, what's the fourth layer? It's purpose. And actually, for us, it's really clear. You know, we'll be the company that changes the sneaker market. You know, do you want to be a part of that change? And now, to be clear, that can be in a few ways. It doesn't mean just selling a load of sneakers and streetwear. It can be about how you impact um, change. So, for example, we've got a thing called Her Edit London. So, the rise of the female sneaker, how do we shine a light on females within the market, you know, and their kind of designing capabilities? So, we've got this whole thing. Um, it, I'll, I'll tell you quickly. So if you know, you know when you buy a shoe, you get stickers, right? And obviously, you stick them on your laptop. So we did a thing where we took a female designer who designed for Nike. She created the first Edit London sticker pack. So then we were like, all right, we did a nice panel talk with a bunch of, you know, cool people from New Balance and Nike and stuff. Next part was like, how do we take Chivis Regal? So we're going to create a bottle pack with, say, the Travis Scott fragment colorway or whatever, short weather spoons. Um, and shine the light on these four designers. The third part, how do we take it one further? We've got True Religion, who've done two collaborations with Supreme, if you know it. And um, we're doing an upcycling project where we take 10 items, upcycle them, and it's going to be female designers that create that, and we display them as an artwork. So that's just like one example of how you can um, create purpose uh, and create change in a business. So. And, and the, the AI. AI, AI bit, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> look, I think the reality is that, you know, can it help or hinder? I think there are elements that where, where it can absolutely support, but, you know, there's always going to be that human element to, to, to what we're doing, you know. So, um, you know, I think we want to embrace technology where we can embrace it, but then we want to be mindful of the stuff that, um, you know, that, that we as human beings are great, in, uh, great at doing, so... Hi there. So um, uh, you touched earlier on how um, marketing varies by country. So say how Saudi is still on the Yeezy trend, yeah. America is still on Jordans. How do you as a company adjust to, because uh, the resale market is, is obviously a very live, um, a very hot press thing. Uh, one week it's Dunks, the next week it's Jordan 1s, etc. So how say, for example, the Nike Dunk craze over the past 12 months versus the Jordan 1 mid craze of the 12 months before that, how do you adjust as a company to what the market or what the demand is at that point in time? Yeah, it's a really good question. Good knowledge, by the way, um, buddy. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, what's, what's great is our job is about knowing what the trends are before they happen. And actually, we've got a whole bunch of resellers that actually work in the business um, that are connected through Discord and WhatsApp to hundreds of thousands of, um, of people that are looking for product. 
do you remember Telfers? Have you guys seen Telfers? Yeah. We called that out probably about a year before they started dropping, you know, people started jumping on them here. So we bought a whole load of them over from the US, dropped them up on the site they all sold to, like, let's, let's keep on pushing those. Um, Uggs, for example, about six months before they came, and obviously became a thing here and then kind of hits the, you know, the, the mass market. Um, you know, so we're, we're seeing this stuff, thankfully, right the way through. As you say, you know, as you enter into new markets, the nuances are very, very different. Um, and again, we've got teams of people, in most kind of retail businesses, they would call them buyers. In our, in, in our you know, we, we call them kind of growth experts. So actually, a lot of what they do is just figure out, like, what, what are people requesting? Now, there's this whole part to the business. So if I just break it down into three parts, right? So you've got your online stuff, and we've got lots of data that supports our, you know, the decisions where we can um, really drive the value on certain products. And actually, we instruct our what we refer to as our baller resellers to go and buy those products. And we're like, hey, we're going to get... You know, we've got deals with most of the, like the Premier League, NBA, and, and NFL, right? And we do these private shopping events with them. So we say, look, you know, go and buy a load of these, and straight away they'll get sell, sold to the Manchester United First Eleven. You know, the Travis Scotts that I'm wearing now, for example. Part two is then obviously we then got a different customer that sits in Harrods or Gallery Lafayette. They're not really, um, they're not so to speak like sneakerheads. They're people that see Kylie Jenner wearing an Adidas Samba. Right, and then suddenly wants it because they've just seen loads of people wearing it. Then you've got this uh, this other bucket, which are, as I mentioned, the, the private shopping with the NBA and the NFL players and all the rest of it. Now they're just like, I want stuff quickly, right? Um, you know, the Tiffany Air Force One that recently dropped, one thousand eight hundred thirty-seven pairs. So we had about thirty pairs in our HQ about five weeks before release. And so essentially, what we're doing is we're selling them to celebrities and high net worth who are paying for them, but for us to release them to you. You'd have, to, you'd have to tag us on your socials, right? We're not paying for that. Um, the reason why they were doing it is because actually we, we were kind of g giving them the, uh, how do you say, we were just making them look a lot, co a lot cooler, right? If you're pictured wearing a Tiffany five weeks before release, your, you know, your engagement on socials go up. So it's little things like that, how you can, you can tweak, and then it all comes back to you know, just knowing what the customer wants. So. Clearly you've built a fantastic business from an interest you had, and it's turned into something Fantastic that you've been talking about. But you can't be the only person who likes trainers and yeah. sneakers. What gives you the edge over the competitors that you've got? Great question. So we talk about like being the most premium market. We really focus in on three buckets, quite simply, by way of a USP. So part one, we talked about product curation, talked about the Tiffany Air Force One. How do we do it? Part one is that we've got the customer that will buy it. Part two is that we've got the resellers with let's say that get the first access, which then gives us access to this kind of high net worth or bottom affluent. Part two is then we look at speed. If you've purchased from StockX or Go, you know, your shoe could come in two weeks, it could come in five weeks, normally lands around week three. So we said, okay, well, we'll do it in one to seven working days, but that, I'm 100% the guy that'll pay $100 more to get that product today. So we built a same day service. Part, part three then is about experience. So, you know, again, the modern affluent, uh, and actually, by the way, the university demographic could absolutely be put into that, um, is, is all about service, right? And so on a scalable point of view, you say 30 minute response times on emails, one to three minutes on Instagram or chatbot, of course it's instant, but if you're a repeat spender or high net worth, you get to work with our private shoppers. Our private shoppers give you first access to products, outfit build, styling, invites to really cool parties and all this kind of other extra value that, that, that happens. So like I said, we just, you know, then we lump in the final part, a healthy dollop of culture and community. You know, so, you know, kind of be part of our club and we're going to give you all this access to all this cool stuff like the sneaker exhibition and the, the, the drone flying and all that kind of stuff. So. OK, that's great. Thank you ever so much for those questions. And there's some brilliant questions in there. And it's been a fascinating conversation. Um, Moses, I'm, you know, as, a, as someone who went to university with you, I'm, I'm incredibly proud of, of what you've gone on to achieve. Um, I think we all are here at the university. Um, thank you ever so much for, for coming down. Um, before we finish, I'd just like to say a few other thank yous. Thank you to yourselves for coming along and showing such a keen interest um, in this Beyond the Classroom event. I'd like to thank 
uh, the team who've been involved in pulling this together because this just doesn't happen overnight. Um, it, it's, a, it's a big job to get this um, uh, created and, and delivered. So thank you very much to, uh, to Trudy and Catherine um, from the alumni marketing team, um, for, to Amber and Lucy especially from, from the sport and recreation team and all the other people who, who've been involved in, in bringing this together. On to the last bit here. So as part of the Ravelin um, Sports Centre, uh, this investment, we're sort of doing lots of things to kind of celebrate sport, showcase it, and raise the profile. And uh, one of the things we're doing is creating a Hall of Fame. And that Hall of Fame looks to recognise um, our alumni have gone on to achieve great things in the world of sport or sports-related business. And I'm delighted to say that, uh, that Moses uh, has been uh, selected to go into that Hall of Fame. Um, and he's joining some, some really esteemed names, Lauren Stebman, Graham Edmonds, Leo Mann, Joel Bayer, um, lots of people who are in that. And um, there'll be visual um, uh, sort of um, information that's going up around the building that we come up over the next few months. So um, congratulations and welcome to that Hall of Fame um, for that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and as a... Um, and, and as a kind of a token of our, of our thanks, uh, Moses, um, and uh, we've got a, um, you want to bring it over, Trudy, we've got, uh, we've got a, a, a sort of signed frame shirt of uh, Portsmouth wow. Football Club with the university logo on it. And, wow. um, Thank you very much. And we want you to go and hang that up proudly in your, in your um, fashionable offices in London next to the <laughs> Chicago Bulls top. Uh, and we want to see pictures of that pride of place um, uh, out there. So um, just a small token from, uh, to thank you from us. Um, so all he says, thank you very much again to Moses. And thank you to everyone else. Thank you. Really, thank you. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thank you.